Well, heart failure is a complex disease and it really has multiple components to it. In the basic terms, in the broadest overview, heart failure means the heart is not working properly. It is not supplying the circulatory needs of the body. There are two main categories of heart failure. There is systolic, which is a weakening of the heart muscle, and there is diastolic, which is a stiffening and thickening of the heart muscle. The symptoms are exactly the same. The most common symptoms for heart failure include shortness of breath when you try and exert yourself, shortness of breath when you try and lay down, swelling in your feet, legs, or abdomen, occasionally coughing, especially when you lay down, and in rarer circumstances, chest pain or sinkable passing out spells. But that does not help you in determining the type of heart failure that you have. Risk factors for heart failure depend upon the category. So if we start with the systolic heart failure, which is the weakened heart failure, that is when the heart enlarges and doesn't pump well. It has a weak pump, as they like to refer to it. The most common risk factors for that are the same risk factors for coronary artery disease. Two-thirds of weakened heart failure is due to coronary artery disease. So those risk factors include diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, uh, inactivity, obesity, and family history. The stiff heart failure, the diastolic heart failure, is more related to uh, hypertension and diabetes and less coronary disease. From a sex risk, more women have the stiff heart failure than the weak heart failure, but it's also related to aging. So as, since women live longer, as the age of the population goes up, more women have heart failure than men once you cross the age of 65. It's an equal opportunity offender. Heart failure affects men and women. It affects all races and it affects all ages. Certain statistics is that in the younger age group, it's more men than women because they tend to get heart disease about 10 years earlier than women. As you get older, it switches and becomes more women than men. Uh, the risk factors that we discussed earlier are going to predispose these patients. So diabetes is an incredibly strong risk factor. It eliminates the sex protection and the age protection. So diabetics are at risk of getting heart disease at a much younger age. And then it's, there's always family genetics. So if you've got bad family history of this disease, then you're more likely to have it. There's not a particular way to weight these risk factors and say, well, your family history gives you a 10% chance and your diabetes gives, adds another 7%. Not so much that, it's just one of those, the more risk factors you have, the greater your risk of developing the disease is. The first key to treating a disease is to try and prevent it in the first place. And that's, as a society, I think we're way behind the eight ball on that. Um, and more and more effort is being placed on prevention, um, but that means that, it, that each one of us has to be accountable for our health. So the best thing to do is to try and control risk factors. So that means regular exercise, controlling your weight and not getting overweight, eating a proper diet so that you can control your cholesterol and your blood pressure. If you are diagnosed with some of these things, it becomes even more imperative that you control those and do the lifestyle modifications to improve those. Many people, if they can lose the weight and exercise, can eradicate their need for medications. But a lot of people out there aren't doing that. They're hoping a pill will fix things. And pills can't fix everything. It, it's, it's like when you watch your team fail, not fail, they lose a game. All right, the coach is gonna go to the, that team and say, I am so proud of you guys. You left it all out on the field. There's nothing more you could have done. And even though it doesn't show on the scoreboard, I'm really proud you did it all. That's what we need to get across to our patients. There are some non-coronary artery disease risk factors. So pregnancy-induced cardiomyopathy is going to be a weakened heart failure. There are genetic abnormalities that can cause stiffened heart failure, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, other types of restrictive heart disease. So there are a lot of specialty categories for heart failure, but two thirds of heart failure is related to coronary disease. Mm -hmm. 
treatment options are also based upon the type of heart failure. The only thing they share in common is the symptoms are often the same. So for the weakened systolic heart failure, we have a lot of great medications that when the disease is diagnosed early, we can initiate these oral medications and potentially improve or even recover the pumping function of the heart in some instances. There are four different families of medications and there's tons of research trials to support the use of these medicines. Above that, not only the heart failure medicines, but controlling all the risk factors that the patient has. So going after and tightly controlling the diabetes if they have it, controlling their blood pressure, getting them to stop smoking. That's a big risk factor that I didn't mention earlier. These are all important in the weak heart failure treatment. The stiff diastolic heart failure is a different story altogether. Unfortunately, there have really been no trials that have shown medicines to help. There are no medicines that make the heart relax better and uh, retain less fluid. So all we have to treat the stiff heart failure is to go after the causes. So if there's high blood pressure, get it controlled. If there's valvular heart disease, are they an operative candidate to get it fixed? Otherwise, all we can do is try and control the symptoms, which is fluid retention most of the time, and we do that with diuretics. When patients deteriorate to the point where these medications don't work, then we have to look at more extreme measures for improving quantity and quality of life. First, we have a special kind of pacing defibrillator so that weak hearts that have a special kind of electrical delay could be a candidate for this type of, of pacing defibrillator. It's called um, cardiac resynchronization therapy. But only about 20 to 30 percent of heart failure patients, and this is the weakened heart failure patient, will have that type of electrical delay where they'll benefit. If they do have it, they get the device and they respond, they can do markedly better. If they don't respond, that's a very poor prognostic sign. Beyond that, we have defibrillators in general, and that protects against the sudden death risk for these patients. That is only in the weakened heart failure. There isn't any studies that show that defibrillators will protect a stiff heart patient from sudden death. And so again, we have all of our treatment opportunities in the weakened heart failure, very few in the stiff heart failure. After that, we start to look at the more extreme measures. And there are three potential treatment arms. There is an IV medication that stimulates a weakened heart to pump better. That is often used in the hospital in an acute setting and in certain circumstances can be considered as a chronic outpatient therapy to support them. However, survival is not long. This chronic IV medication has risks and so it's typically only utilized as a bridge to something more definitive or as a palliative treatment to give somebody quality of life for whatever time they will have. The two most definitive long-term potential options in these patient populations are going to be the left ventricular cyst device and cardiac transplantation.